I went and got picked up by my grandparents from school one day and decided that what I really wanted to do is play the guitar that was sitting in my in my parents' house for so long. So my grandfather pulled the car over at a music store and walked in, bought me maybe six months worth of lessons and that was that was it. I'm Kale Crow and my medium is first and foremost music. I'm First Nations and so I've always sort of been influenced by uh, traditional music and I play more of a contemporary sort of mainstream style of music but culturally I definitely got my, my sort of musical wherewithal and sort of the math of my music from being around the drum. Music to me is the most powerful vehicle for emotion and cultural movement in the world and so I don't think that there's any art form or any mode of expression that's quite like music, you know? Music was always uh, recontextualizing a lot of the events in my life, um, you know, from the most joyous memories of rolling around in the in the back of a Ford Bronco listening to Aerosmith or the Rolling Stones to, um, you know, events like dropping out of school. I was never trying to get famous or pick up chicks or any of that cliche stuff. I was, I was trying to, to feel better about myself in a, in a mental state and I was trying to better myself in a social state. I was trying to make friends, honestly. One of the bigger influences going into high school was Green Day. I went into high school not long after American Idiot came out. I remember the first time I ever saw Bullet in a Bible, the, the one they did in, uh, in England. Um, and seeing a whole field full of people um, singing the lyrics back was like, man, like, that's, that's the dream, you know? My grandfather took me to uh, his brother's studio in Belleville. I ended up recording some of my first demos in that studio. I put out my first record in 2015 after having dropped out of university and picking up music for a living, I decided to try school again and go into the music business management program in Durham. And from there, I was able to learn kind of all of the things that I know how to do now. So, you know, booking, planning events, uh, negotiating deals, things like that. After I graduated, I went right back into full-time music and from there, I'm coming out with a new EP at the end of this year. You can be your quiet self, now these seconds in, before the morning. I, I consider a lot of my, my writing to be flashback in nature. You know, I could be in, a, in the park, or I could be in a cafe, or I could be in my car, and I will just, an arrangement of words will just happen. Um, based on things that I'm perceiving and it'll harken me back to something that I've experienced and it'll kind of trigger a sort of a, a cascade or an avalanche of thought and feeling. Sometimes it's only a line or a verse or it could be the whole song. So like in the case of If You Let Me, I wrote that song inside of maybe an hour and a half. Whereas other times, you know, I'll sit on a song for maybe anywhere from six months to two or three years. So I'll wait for this to be over for all my days had me on to this moment but I'm not afraid I will take you so broken and in my way, I will love if you let me, I'll burn till you let me go. Benchmark of success for me is paycheck, sure, but also seeing someone perk up when they hear a song that they know. 
because I do a lot of covers. And so hearing a song that they know and that they haven't heard in the way that I'm doing it, like when I'm in a bar, that's like, yes, I've, I've made an impression. That's my whole job is just to make that impression. That sense of home has always been really like integral to my music. So, you know, I've lived in Peterborough, Oshawa, Toronto, um, but it always feels like a pit stop on the way back, you know? While we are feeling more isolated, people really turn to the arts and realize how important it was to have art in their lives. That is the main goal of my artwork, is for people to not feel so alone with their struggles and to realize that most of these things are universal issues. My name is Kate Hessen and I make paintings with watercolor and ink and sculptures in paper crepe. As a child, I grew up making art all the time and I was really creative and my parents were really supportive and they would take me to the Art Gallery of Northumberland. I would, was exposed to artists and galleries and was really lucky in that way. I ended up going to the Ontario College of Art and Design in Toronto to pursue a degree in illustration. And um, at some point I decided illustration wasn't really my path and that I wanted to be an artist. I make sculptures out of papercrete, um, which has kind of been a long-term love of mine. I started making paper mache sculptures as a kid, and I love process. I love um, that it takes a long time, and there are steps to creating these sculptures. And um, kind of got away from it as I pursued my degree, and I did some ceramics um, in university, and then move back towards um, paper mache sculptures as I um, started exploring what mediums I was interested in. Um, and then paper crete was just kind of like the next step for paper mache. So instead of applying strips with glue that you would for paper mache, I actually make um, paper pulp mixed with drywall concrete or um, with mortar that you would use for tiles. And so it makes almost like a concrete and paper pulp material that you can sculpt with, almost like clay. Something that I really find works well with sculptures is to take something that's very simple um, as a drawing, such as a moth with a face, and then turn that into a sculpture and bringing it into three-dimensionality really changes the way that the work is perceived. I think artists that inspired me um, would be Nikki de saint Fal, so she was a French-American painter and um, worked in sculpture and worked in the female form as well, and I love all of her work. And then Louise Bourgeois is another one of my favorite painters um, and sculptors, and both of these artists worked in both sculpture and um, works on paper, which I find really interesting. Um, and both of them did work around the themes of um, motherhood and their experiences, even though those are lesser known works, they still were creating works on that theme and um, that's something I'm really interested in. The themes in my artwork that would be present in all of the work is a kind of tension between light and dark. Um, I like to think about these two polar opposite things like love and fear and joy and pain and that tension that is created in these two disparate things. When I had my daughter was when I became more serious about my art practice and a lot of things shifted and changed for me and that's when I started making the work that I'm making around the topics of motherhood and birth and transformation. Being a mother attracted me to the medium of watercolor and ink for sure. Um, it was something that I had explored before but having the ability to make work very quickly um, was attractive to me as a new mother because I didn't have a lot of time and was working in these in-between moments. I also discuss um, a lot of struggles and um, kind of more like hard subjects but in a more whimsical way so I like if my artwork looks kind of fun or colorful or can draw you in and then you realize that there's some um, bigger issues being dealt with like postpartum anxiety and the postpartum body struggles that so many women have. Something that is really important to me is making a lot of work um, and making sure that you are 
just experimenting as much as you can. My ideal piece of work has a naive, effortless quality to it, and you can only get that by making lots of mistakes. There's a lot of people and organizations like the Art Gallery of Northumberland that are really supportive of artists and um, want to see more artists and more art being made. And so I'm really happy to be an artist in Northumberland County. There were always records around in my house, be it uh, Joni Mitchell or ABBA or different musicals, and, and I just grew up with that whole culture of listening to music. My name's Ian Jack. I am a musician, an educator, a writer, uh, and an arranger. And I have lived the majority of my life in Northumberland with seven years in Thunder Bay, five in Hamilton and one in Kingston. Otherwise, I've lived between Coburg and Port Hope. My dad was a high school music teacher at both high schools when they existed. And my mom was involved in a lot of folk groups uh, when she was in high school. By the time I was in about grade four, I became very interested in pop music. It was around the time that I figured out that you could record things off the radio and I would sit uh, waiting for the song that I wanted and, and hit record and make mixtapes. And around 15, discovered um, more punk rock and new wave and wanted to play guitar. So I hacked through that for a number of years and, and I actually lived next to George Lee. Um, I lived with my grandmother and uh, they were neighbors and George gave me my first few lessons of guitar, uh, just a, a few months, but it was enough to, uh, to get me going. And then we had basement bands, uh, garage bands, which uh, were, were of varying quality. It wasn't until I was about 18 where I figured out that you could actually write your own songs. Fumbled for a number of years and uh, I would say in my last sort of 10, 20 years I've, I've been creating things that you know, I've been happy with and happy to share with people. You can see that certainly in my art, you know, different phases of who influenced uh, my work. I think I've just got better at mixing it up a little bit, putting it through the blender. One of the biggest influences on me would be a band called Sloan. Um, so they, they've been a, a huge, huge influence. Another band out of Dayton, Ohio called Guided by Voices is a, a big influence on me. What I make is certainly uh, a combination of indie rock, electro pop, and uh, I, I would say, you know, kind of folk rock. I will sit down with a guitar, sit down at the piano, and it will differ. Sometimes I will just sort of stream of consciousness and see what sort of things just kind of come up. You know, I've looked at some of the different patterns that exist in, you know, pop and rock and country music and try to apply those, so different chord patterns. I was at one time using, you know, just using my guitar quite a bit and just using chords and coming up with a chord structure and then trying to uh, put a melody on top of that. Now I will attempt to uh, sing a melody or play a melody and then try to add chords after the fact. My other process would be to try to have a number of different projects. So, you know, if I feel like, you know, I'm doing too much in like the rock realm or the, you know, the folky guitar realm, then it's time to pick up the synthesizer and focus on that. And I write everything down. I try not to edit anything. A lot of it is absolute garbage. Uh, but that's, you know, that's the process. I, I find when you get too precious about it and you think, oh, it's not going to be, this isn't going to be, you know, worth looking at, there may be one line that, uh, you know, you can spark something new and still salvage something. Karen and I have been married 25 years this June. Every single um, project that I've been involved in with regards to like recording has always involved Kara. So she has been extremely influential on the art that I do because I think that she elevates everything with her voice. This is Head Pets, Plain Clothes Heroes. And this was produced uh, by our friend Kevin Komoda, who is a Montreal legend. And we self-released that one. We, we did the whole do-it-yourself 
This is the loft party. So this is Kara and I, and then uh, Kevin uh, Komoda co-wrote this album with me. And uh, it is filled with uh, many electropop gems. And then our recent one that we just released this year is North Hope Exit Strategies. This is the second recording that uh, Dan Stokes and Jeff Bemrose and my wife Kara Jack have recorded with me. The through line is always uh, about relationships. It's always about processing experiences and then trying to do it in an impressionistic way. And I always like it when my eldest son will say to me, what's, what's that about? I think it's about this. And I'm like, well, I said it might be. You know, like I, I, I'm very much of that idea of, you know, like giving a little bit away, but I, I think that's what keeps people listening over and over and over again. When I was little, when I think back on it now, I always had a story in my art. There was a fear involved. You're putting a piece of you on display. There's a piece of your heart and soul in that. I'm Jennifer Trefiak. Um, my medium is acrylics and oils. I'm from Alderville First Nation. I grew up in Coburg and I paint what I call intuitive landscapes. These are landscapes from places that I've been where I have a feeling or an emotion from the land. And I also intertwine themes of meaning of place to First Nations people, uh, the sacred feminine, the meaning of water, and how it is sacred to our culture, um, and climate change as well. And I've always been making art and music, like since I was a little kid. One of the best things that my parents ever did was buy me that big box of 64 Crayolas that used to get for school with the gold and the silver and the turquoise. So if I drew something, I would always explain to my mom and dad, this is what's happening in this art, which became frustrating when I went to school because they want you to color inside the lines and I was not that type of person. I started painting in high school when I took art class, but I loved art class. There was just something meditative about that process. And I, I, I like to push the boundaries. So I didn't have the best grades, but you know, I was trying to say something and to me that was important. And then, you know, you kind of lose that sometimes when you're becoming an adult. And then I just was like, I need to paint again. I need to, I just need to do this. And so I went and I just got a starter set and started painting for myself. But then people started to say, hey, your art's okay. Like maybe you should start doing something with it. 2016 was, a, the, was sort of a turning point because I had done some smaller public shows. That's when I started focusing on it as my career. I did not try oil paint until three years ago. And I just decided, you know what? It's time to move on to oils. It's, it's a more workable medium. It just felt like I needed that challenge and they are a challenge. Acrylic paint dries really quickly, uh, so it doesn't stay workable. There are things you can do to make it workable. Um, but generally, if you do a painting and it's not that great, you just paint over it. Whereas with oil paint, you can open it back up, you can edit it. So I'm always experimenting. I always have my series that I'm working on through the year, and then I have some experimental pieces just for me, just to see what happens if I do this. You need to look at other people to learn, but you also need to learn your own thing. So to develop your own style, your own meaning behind it, all of that. When I was a kid and I would say, well, I wanna be an artist, my family would never be like, oh, well, what's your backup plan? because we already had an artist in the family. My cousin, Rick Beaver, he also is um, a, an advocate for nature conservation and he's well educated and he does do talks and tours around the county to help educate youth on, on those issues. So that's, he was a big influence in that way. When I saw a, a show at the AGO from Rita LaTondra, she's, she was originally from Montreal, I believe she's in Toronto now. She had these huge acrylic, like taking up the wall, acrylic paintings, and they were just vibrant and they were just really lines, but imitating light. And I think the possibility of painting a huge space like that, that was exciting as well. Normally, 
I will visit a place. And for me, that's camping. I get out on the land and I just wait until I feel something. I take a lot of photos and I'll choose ones that I, that I like and sort of adapt them to a painting. I want to convey an emotion or a feeling or a theme. Then I, I will sometimes do a loose sketch on a canvas. Sometimes I don't. Sometimes I just go, go right to it with the paint. It will tell you what it needs. And then if it is like, no, this is not working, and I do have a lot of those, um, I will just set that painting aside for a while. Sometimes you need to take a walk. There's a spirituality to the, to the places that I've been. The water features heavily. So in Indigenous culture, women are the caretakers of water, and water is sacred. I try to put that emotion in my last series. To me, it doesn't always have to be a deep, deep thing. If you like something just because it sounds nice or it looks pretty, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But I also think if you're a creator, yeah, you need to push the boundaries of both you and your audience. I think if you feel something or if something makes you think deeper about something, then the job of the artist is well done. A big thing for me back in high school was doing um, media studies classes, all, both as someone who was kind of creating my own little publications and just as a lens through which to see the world. I'm a mixed media artist that um, works across digital and physical uh, mediums, but the consistent thing throughout um, is sort of collage, basically, um, different forms of what could be called mashups or remixing or um, just combining elements in a very improvisational kind of way. I was born in Toronto and raised there. Um, went to an art high school, Claude Watson there, and um, I lived there till I was 30 and I moved out here to Port Hope where I've been for 10 years now. I was really into stuff like David Carson, Ray Gun Magazine and things like this where it kind of blended over into this abstract expressive thing but using digital and clean elements and kind of blending the two worlds and and so that's that sort of became my thing i almost call technology my muse in a way um, it kind of keeps one foot in something that's evolving the possibilities and then the other foot in tradition and uh, traditional media and working on physical stuff. Like I fell in love with the work of Basquiat, Robert Rauschenberg, and various other abstract expressive and kind of in-between painters and like very physical kind of mark making. But I did decide fairly early on to dedicate myself to, to fine art, which I've wavered from a few times, but it always seems to pull me back to, to it. I have built up a kind of language of my own that I think is related to pop art in certain respects. It's one of the main things I love about creating art and I guess in the way that I do is that it's as much a surprise for me watching what emerges as it is for the audience. That often at first meant like paint pastel, paint marker, um, using acrylic and stuff in different ways and then collaging in some digital prints and that kind of thing. But I've sort of expanded that out to using um, a lot of different holographic luminescent kind of materials in the last while where, and also using resin where I can layer uh, elements into what is actually sort of like layers of clear resin that um, give it a depth. I have like hundreds of sketchbooks of just like simple characters and simple elements and I sort of batch scan those in or use them directly but often incorporate them into other collage techniques on the computer or this kind of thing. There's you know cheesy expressions like we, there's no mistakes just happy accidents and this kind of thing but for, that's, I, it's true that oftentimes artists are a little too concerned with what ends up blocking 
um, an ability to just let something happen. Although the, the similar thing is when I work, I tend to work quite a bit and intensively. I mean, it doesn't feel like working, it's playing really, which is vital to my process. I mean, I'd call it playing. There hasn't been a specific show or project or thing that I'm exactly making work for. And so it's been a really good time for bringing in new elements with a lot of more recent photo collage type stuff that I've been doing. Um, I've called them this Hope Portal series, basically playing around with um, panoramic photography and 360 photography, and then really taking into the computer and really um, exploring ways to combine um, both inner and outer landscapes around town. Um, inside my studio, <laughs> bridging in the art making process into the actual pieces a little bit. Leo Castelli, who is like one of the really cool art dealers back in 70s, 80s in New York and elsewhere. One thing he said that um, resounds with me quite a bit is that the best art is ambiguous. The world tends to be ambiguous. I mean, there's many plot lines going on and kind of at odds with each other. And it feels like a more interesting way to reflect the world and to offer new vistas or new, new kind of views of the world um, and ways of seeing the world. There wasn't anything particular that attracted me to my medium. It became a great means to express how I was feeling in life, you know, almost like a, um, a steel string diary. I'm from Kendall, Ontario. We are sitting in the barn where I was raised right now. Um, I've lived here since I was four years old. My parents still live here and I live down the road in Coburg, uh, but I spend a lot of my time here. And uh, I draw from these surroundings a lot in my songwriting and in my aesthetic, as you can see. I was raised around a lot of people that played music very, very well. I couldn't help but absorb a lot of that through osmosis. So when I was about 24, I taught myself to play guitar. Neil Young is a is kind of, of a, a musical hero of mine. And so I know all of his songs very well. So I got like an easy, like easy tab, like, you know, I think it was Harvest. And uh, I just knew how those songs go. So I started, you know, back and forth, doing the little chord progressions, back and forth, back and forth, three chords. Yeah, I just kept at it. And it's just also teaching you the beauty of like, if you just can keep something simple, you know, you can also get a pretty powerful message across by just keeping it simple um, chord wise. But then also that being said, Gordon Lightfoot is a huge, is a huge a hero of mine. Nature is probably uh, my, my mightiest muse. Well, maybe second only to heartache, but these hills, these trees, the creaking of these barns. I don't come up with any ideas. You know, like I, I don't sit, I'm not like, what am I gonna write about today? You know, it's like, generally life is interesting enough where it can kind of th throw some ideas at you pretty consistently, mine anyways. Sometimes it'll just start with a line, you know, and that'll germinate and turn into a verse or a chorus. I've played with a lot of the same musicians for almost the whole time that I've been playing music. So, you know, for instance, if I'm, if I'm writing like 17 or one of the songs on my last record, I can almost hear like my friend Anna Ruddick who plays bass, she's a monster, she's incredible. But I can almost hear what Anna's gonna do, you know? And so that kind of helps me. Or I can hear the drums, you know, behind something simple that I'm writing. And then I take it to the studio and weirdly, it seems to sort of unfold like that. I like to keep a pretty steady clip, you know? If something isn't working, then we kind of move on. And if something is great, then we, we ride it out. You know, the studio is my favorite place to be. It's, it's, when, the, it's, it's when you're creating, it's when, it's when the art is alive. My next mistake was actually, it's, it was an accidental record. Uh, I recorded it at Taurus Record Recording Studios in, in Toronto, in North Toronto. 
uh, my friend Tom Darcy, who's from uh, just north of Oshawa, actually. It's his studio. He's a producer and a lifelong friend, and I wanted to exercise my songwriting. I've always written alone. It's always been a, a very pointed um, process for me, where it's like, I'm sad, I need to talk about that. I just had this amazing thing, I just happened, I need to talk about that, and I do that in my music. But with Tom, he's just so creative and so fluid. I just called him and I said, look, man, you want to try writing with me? And so in four days, I went to his, his new studio, and in four days, we'd written five songs. Two weeks later, we had a record. When I wrote my next mistake, I was a year clean, no drugs, no alcohol. And so that was the first time uh, that had happened for me before. And to be honest, I was like, man, I, I hope I can write. You know, like when you party, there's, your life really gives you a lot to write about. There's a lot of drama going on, you know? There's so much uh, more authenticity to access when you're just healthy, which I wasn't aware of. And I love it. Like. I've since written another record and recorded another record, like, just because it's what I do now. While everyone else is out partying, I'm writing songs, so it's been quite productive. I want to play shows so badly, because especially, you know, like, that's how I get high now, you know, like, that energy of, like, commanding a room. It's just this feeling of, of truly being seen and truly being heard. Art is kind of like the manifestation of, like, the world psyche, I guess. It's an expression of sometimes how an entire community feels through the eyes of the artist, you know? It inspires and moves people and has since the first brushstroke. stroke.